you've tuned in to the 49ers Rush Podcast, and here is your host, John Chapman. All right, 49ers fans, welcome back to another episode of the 49ers Rush Podcast with John Chapman. I am excited today. We are going to continue our deep dive into the 49ers 2019 draft with Jalen Hurd. Holy cow, absolutely love this kid. And this episode is going to be a little bit different than most because, you know, my background as a you know high school coach in Texas, I have several a uh, couple <laughs> people that I know throughout the state with some uh, well placed sources, whatnot, and so I was able to get a lot of backstory on this kid. So we're going to go through and talk about you know obviously the film and all of those things. However, we are also going to talk about exactly why this kid got to where he is um it's a very interesting story nonetheless but it's it's interesting because we've seen this a lot with kyle shanahan and john lynch they have taken some very questionable picks with some guys that have had some weird trajectories to the nfl and jalen hurd is top notch whenever it comes to that uh you know the one of the leading rushers in the sec for tennessee a lot of people forget he was the reason why Alvin Kamara was not a starter at the University of Tennessee. It was Jalen Hurd. And, you know, he eventually leaves. I'm going to detail that, break down some film and some pro day workout stuff with some stats as well. So just some very basic um, information on Jalen Hurd. And let's jump right into it, right? So he is picked in the third pick of the third round, 67 overall, a wide receiver out of Baylor, just under 6'5". He's a big freak, um, athletic guy, 226 pounds. He ran a 46640 at his pro day. And I'm going to break down more of his pro day stuff. Um, 32 inch arms. 10 and a quarter inch hands, which very, very large hands for a wide receiver for anybody, really. And he's 23 years old. A big reason why he is 23 years old is just the route that he went through to get to the NFL. And it's very interesting. So uh, here's a couple of weird just stats that the NFL put out. In 2016, Jalen Hurd transfers from Tennessee and Alvin Kamara then becomes the starting running back at Tennessee. 2017. The 49ers trade the 67th pick to the Saints for Alvin Kamara, 2018. 49ers select with the same 67th pick, Jalen Hurd. So just some kind of fun, like, man, you couldn't write that if you wanted to. But just the similarities between these two players who will forever be intertwined and how that's come through. Now, a lot of this is taken from an NFL.com article written by Chase Goodbread and also a buddy who works for Baylor and is a part of that staff there. He asked me to leave his name off this. That's fine. But, uh, you know, just asking lots of questions, an old drinking buddy. And, you know, you get a lot of these different stories that just provide some context and, I don't know, it makes it a little bit more uh, come to life, I guess. So right off the bat at Tennessee, Hurd makes it very clear. Um, that he did not like the way the offense was being run at Tennessee. Butch Jones just basically, he he used his, his body to his chagrin. And, you know, if you're an old Cowboys fan, you go back to Butch Jones' entire length of his career, definitely shady from start to finish. There's no doubt about that. But the issue was um, Butch Jones kept wanting Alvin, uh, sorry, <laughs> look at that, Jalen Hurd to play Hurt. And Jalen Hurd was fine with that. You know, he was fourth in the SEC in rushes two years in a row, and his body was just being destroyed repetitively. Now, um, Hurd was – he's not the type of guy that's going to keep his mouth shut. He's going to say what he wants, and he's going to speak his mind. And several different times he asked if he could be used in different ways. He's just tearing his body up. He's going to be used up and all those things. And Butch Jones repeatedly kept telling him, yes, we're going to change it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't transfer. We're going to you know, cater to kind of your skill set and make sure you're a focal point of our offense, but please don't leave. Please don't leave. Well, the issue happened with there were four games left in the season at Tennessee, and he went ahead and just went and transferred. He left, and the reason why is very, very interesting. Now, keep in mind, he would have been drafted as running back probably in that third to fourth round, very similar to where Kamara went. So he was already NFL bound. But the problem was um, 
he didn't want his career to be so short lived as most running backs are. He wanted a longer career in the NFL. And unfortunately, his coach was not willing to help him. And again, it's not like he was a nobody. He's 440 yards away from the all-time Tennessee rushing record behind only Travis Henry and Arian Foster. So this guy, he, he did it for a very long time. So he decides to transfer. You know, He sticks around the program, even though there's four games left in the season. And he addresses the entire team and explained why he had to leave. So here's the issue that happened. It happened to the game before. The University of Tennessee is playing Georgia, and Tennessee is up late. Well, in the second half, Hurd goes out of the game. And you see him on the sideline, and nobody really knows what's going on, and nobody's commenting as to why he's hurt. Everybody assumed it was a lower body, whatever else. Well, it was a concussion. And he was out with concussion-like system uh, symptoms, and the quality control coach kept him on the sideline and all these things. Well, UT, they give up the lead, as Tennessee usually does. And Georgia takes the lead at the very end. And so, basically, Tennessee has, like, one of those last-ditch efforts to where they're going to be, you know, tossing the ball back and forth, you know, just kind of scramble around. Let's see if we can get this game back. Well, Butch, go- Butch, Butch Jones, the head coach of Tennessee, goes up to him. And, again, this is all detailed in that article on NFL.com. It says, I need you out there. This is your play. Well, football players, this is why we have to have rules because football players are football players, and they will always go back out there. Look at people like Ronnie Lott. Yeah, cut my finger off. I don't care. They put the team first. And so Hurt picks up his helmet. He goes and finds his helmet and goes back out there, even though um, he should not be out there. So he goes back out there, and afterward, Hurt, like, realized he's actually really hurt. Um now, what happens is Jones goes up to Hurd after this and tells him, hey, I need you to tell everybody this was not a head issue. This was a lower body issue. Um, Hurd agreed because he didn't want a concussion on his record, which again would have docked him in the draft process and all these things. The NFL uh, reached out to the quality control coach at the time who has moved on to Alabama, and mm-hmm. Nick Saban has a protocol that um, his quality control coaches cannot be interviewed by the media Surprise, surprise, Nick Saban <laughs> definitely not going to whatever unturn anybody's skeletons because he's got probably the most in the entire college thing. But whatever. So Hurd has come out and said he admits he shouldn't have gone back in, but he did what he had to do. Now, And his biggest regret was not staying with his team, but this just goes to show you why he left. The idea of him quitting on his team or whatever, if the story ended here – I think that we could understand that. And then the parallels between this and Joe Williams several years ago, they're there. Now he decides he takes just a year off because the transfer rules in NCA. He just takes a year off from football, and he gets away from the scene. Now he has to choose between, and everybody wanted this guy. Ohio State and Louisville were the two biggest offers that were basically trying to get him to come to their school for wide receiver purposes. And he ended up choosing Baylor, and it was completely by happenstance. Um, he was driving through Texas on his way to Southern California and he drove past the stadium at, uh, in Waco, which is right there off the interstate. Uh, they're getting gas. He looks at it and says, man, that stadium looks nice. Let's go check it out. So he drives over to Waco. He meets with coach Matt rule, which, um, Matt rule knew who he was, but he had no clue. He wanted to play wide receiver. He gets a tour. Absolutely loved it there. And that's the thing. Like, that was it. Uh, He he chose all of – he chose Baylor over these other schools. And he even said he didn't want to go to another place that had the crazy fanfare um, and all the expectations that went on that. He wanted to go focus on football, and he didn't want to be that kind of celebrity, you know, icon from day one. He just wanted to play football, and he thought that Baylor, he would be able to do that. Now – Once he's at Baylor, he thrives. He steps in automatically and just goes lights out. Now, um, Rule said that Hurd was the last one on the field every single day. So much so, you know, I I called my source and I asked him, I was like, man, you know, every coach seems to say, oh, last one off the field, all that. He said, no, you don't understand. With him having such a limited time at wide receiver, he wanted to make sure that he got enough catches in to catch up to all the wide receivers that played four years or their whole career at that. So what he did is they assigned one quality control coach just to Jalen Hurd after the game, uh, after practice every day, and he would just run the jugs machine. So much so 
that Coach Rule with Baylor had to reposition where he gets interviewed uh, after practice for you know the Baylor stuff because the jugs machine was just too loud. And so every single day after uh, practice, it was just heard out there with a quality control coach just feeding him jugs balls, just working on his hands. And I went back and found a couple of the uh, – the videos of Matt Rule's press conferences or interviews after practice, and you can hear it in the background. Choom, 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 the whole time. <laughs> uh, so the idea that this kid is a workaholic, that's just the truth. Um, a lot of people at Baylor, say, uh, my buddy said, complain all the time about the voice or the sound in the background, but it's just what it is. And, you know, if we go throughout the season, Hurd gets banged up again. He gets a, a hurt knee. And this is versus Texas Tech. But he chose to play out that game because if Baylor won, they would have became bowl eligible. If they lost that game, then they wouldn't. So he played completely as a decoy that, you know, you go back and you watch that Texas Tech film and you're just like, I don't get it. Well, he's playing hurt. And he was out there just as a decoy and a blocker uh, just because he's that elite. And, you know, Matt Rule, the coach there, what they do, this is a, a Baylor tradition under Rule. He did the same thing at Temple. He allows every t- he allows every player on the team to vote for the toughest player on the team, and whoever they rank them one through ten, and those one through ten guys, that's the jersey they get. So the toughest player on the team gets one, second toughest two, so on and so forth. Jalen Hurd was there for one year as a transfer, and he's wearing the number five jersey. So this shows you if your question is, and you know John Lynch alluded to this, we're looking for good teammates, we're looking for good locker room guys. That's what we want. Good football players, good locker rooms. Jalen Hurd fits that completely. So if the narrative of, well, he quit on his team, which I've seen out there on Twitter, that's fine. And if you want to stop the narrative there, that's your prerogative. However, if if you follow this story and you see who he is and how his coach and how his teammates at Baylor and all the issues that he had there, I don't think that you can walk away with any question marks as far as character concerns go with Jalen Hurd. I just don't think it's possible. Now – Let's move now to his pro day traits, and these things are a thing of beauty. He is an elite physical specimen, okay? So if you just look at his body composition, right? So he's 6'4 and 3 quarters, so that's 95th percentile for all wide receivers in the NFL. Weight, 226, 94th percentile. And again, uh, Kyle Shanahan even said this at his press conference. He can add 20 pounds. Uh, he played at 240 at Tennessee at running back, so he's slimmed down. Um, he is top notch everywhere. Hand size 10 and a quarter, 93 percent uh, percentile. Now bench press that he did 23 reps, 96 percentile. So big, strong. Now his speed there, you know, he ran the four six six at his pro day, but his explosiveness is what separates him. Vertical, a 40 inch vertical, third best. In the entire wide receiver class, you know, if you combine his height, his arm length, and his vertical jump, which is how I comp- uh, come up with my catch radius chart, he is the fifth best catch radius in this entire draft. Uh, the kid just covers so much space. Broad jump, 10 10. That's fourth best out of all wide receivers. Now, Kyle Shanahan's favorite metric with wide receivers is the three cone drill. And before Debo Samuel, he ran a 7.04. Every wide receiver he brought in was a sub-seven guy in the three-cone. Well, where does he fit in this? He's a bigger guy. Doesn't matter. 6.603 cone time. Now, it is at it is at the Baylor Pro Day, so you have to put a little asterisk next to that because everybody does better times at the Pro Day. But just measuring this time, this is the sixth best three-cone this decade by a wide receiver. By far the best in 2019 out of this wide receiver draft class. This is beyond it, and for a guy that is almost 6'5", this is, it's, I'm not saying he's Calvin Johnson, but the freakish athleticism, it matches, it matches. He's not Calvin Johnson. He doesn't have the agility, but these things say that he does have that, and the top end speed's not there. Short shuttle, 3.87, best in this draft class, ninth best all time since the combine started, um, the guy's just, he's special. He's just very, very special. I don't, I don't know how else to say that. Now, before I jump into all of my coaching notes and some of the stats and metrics, I want to take just a second to thank our sponsor, Game Day Sports and Memorabilia. I know you hear me talking about them all the time, but that's just because I love these guys. 
My kids run around with a bunch of 49ers stuff. They got it up on their walls. All thanks to these guys. They have some of the best products out there. Authenticity guaranteed, sometimes double-backed. Head over to gamedaysportsmemorabilia.com. And whatever your team, whatever the sport, whatever your need, they have all kinds of price ranges from $40 up to insane, uh, almost impossible stuff to get. And if you're a 49ers fan, you're talking 20-plus pages of just nothing but autographed and signed memorabilia from our team. So head over there, 49, uh, tell them the 49ers Rush podcast and John Chapman sent you, and they will take care of you. Very, very easy to deal with and zero issues with shipping or authenticity. Now, let's jump over to, I just want to talk briefly about his time at Tennessee. So he was there for his freshman, sophomore, junior year, true freshman, sophomore, junior year, and he didn't miss any games. Uh, played all 13 games as a freshman, all 13 games as a sophomore. He played his first seven games as a junior. This guy had 637 rushing attempts over the course of that time. He was getting used up and 2,800 yards rushing over those over that time. And, you know, he's very, very special. 4.5 yards per carry as an average for his career, and that's through the SEC. Uh, 23 yards, uh, 23 touchdowns rushing. This this guy, he, he just got in the end zone. He was very, very effective. And again, you, you look at what Alvin Kamara has done in the NFL. This guy sat behind him. Now, he's obviously a great receiver out of the backfield uh, whenever he's with Tennessee. 35 receptions his freshman year, 22 receptions his sophomore year, and then in his seven games before he transferred, he only had 10 receptions. Two touchdowns receiving each one of those years. Then he takes the change to Baylor. Comes out, he played in every game for Baylor, uh, all 12 games. He did still run the ball some, so if you go back and you watch his highlights, he was still rushing. And they put him back there during short yardage situations. I think the 49ers could do that for sure. I'll talk a little bit more about scheme fit here in a little bit. But, um, you know, he, he had 48 rushing attempts for Baylor. So you're, you're talking four rushing attempts a game. And goal line for the end zone, they'd put him back there. Or if it was, you know, third and one or fourth and two, they'd put him back there. So he got three rushing touchdowns. And even though he was used in short yardage situations, he still averaged 4.4 yards per carry. Um, receiving wise, however, he played mostly in the slot. And so he was a slot and flanker guy. Baylor does a lot of trips and he was almost never the outside guy. He was either the second wide receiver or the third wide receiver in line and in, in trips. They put him in the ba- uh, backfield some at running back. He do jet sweeps. He did all those things. So he, he hasn't really ran a very complex route tree. However, his hips And his feet and his stem work is great. Uh, You watch the film and you're just like, holy cow. It's very unique to see a big guy stem like he does. Um, And and so whenever he approaches the cornerback or the safety or whoever's guarding him, and whenever he breaks down, whenever he's going in and out of his cuts, it's a thing of beauty for a guy that is that big. And a lot of that's just because of his elite athleticism. So – of all of the snaps he took, again, 434 of those snaps that he took were slot snaps. So that tells you this guy played there predominantly. Um, he caught 16 deep balls, which were 20 or more yards in the air, which is top notch as far as all across the NCAA. He did have 10 drops on 149 targets. And a lot of those drops, I watched every single one of his game films from uh, Baylor this year, all 12. He's a contested catch freak. They send him over the middle, and they let him take a thumping. They had no problem with him running, you know, just that kind of seven-yard in straight into the middle linebacker, the shallow post from the third wide receiver in, straight into the safety, and this guy just kept going over the middle. Uh, probably the most common route he run he ran was that 12-yard in or a dig route, as it's called sometimes, where it's just passing that zone coverage where the linebackers drop. He gets right in behind the linebacker and cuts straight in, catches the ball straight over the center, and then gets nailed by the safety and the op- opposite side linebacker. This is what he did. He's a zone buster. Um, so I, I, the idea of George Kittle at tight end and him being that big slot 
on one side of the field. Holy cow. If you run zone against that, they are going to eat you alive. The whole time I'm watching this, I'm just like, holy cow, this is perfect. So he had a 68% catch rate, which is pretty good. It's not exceptional. Uh, you would like it to be up in the 70s, especially for a guy that's playing in the slot. But he's not getting typical slot routes. He's running big tight end uh, slot routes. Okay, I talked a little bit about his stats. 34 career touchdowns. 23 of those were rushing, 10 receiving, one fumble recovery for a touchdown. He's just a beast. <laughs> you get this kid the ball, he's going to do stuff. And Kyle Shanahan alluded to this. The thing that we can do with Jalen Hurd is if he puts on more weight, he could be a tight end. You know, we haven't seen him really with his hand at the ground. I don't want to see him with his hand at the ground. He needs to play the big slot. But he can do that kind of offensive weapon thing. He can do the use check where because he, he blocks. He likes to block. He's very, very physical. A problem that he does have is he overruns the block because he wants a knockout blow, and he whiffs sometimes. So he's going to have to kind of chill out and stop going for the knockout pancake block, which is fun watching his highlights because he gets a lot of those where he knocks secondary guys right on their butt. However, he's a long strider, and he covers a lot of ground with his le- with his stride, and because of that, he doesn't break down very well. And so you'll see the corner kind of juke him to go up and make the running, uh, make the tackle versus the running back. So that's something he's going to have to fix. But this is a guy that you can line up out wide. You can line him up in the slot. You could put him kind of at a flanker spot right off the tight end. You put him at full back. You could do a jet sweep. You could put him at running back. You could do everything with this guy. And so, you know, if you put use check, you've got, you know, Matt Breeder or Jarek McKinnon, Jalen Hurd out there. For a defensive personnel guy, as a coach, you know, we have several coaches that would be using their binoculars or whatever, again, high school football, watching the huddle to see who comes out, and they're spotting numbers. If I saw that, you're sitting there thinking, okay, and Kittle, this is a two tight end. Two running back set. That's 22 personnel. We got to load up the box. But with that formation, you can go five wide. Well, if I'm in 22 defensive personnel, I guarantee you I cannot cover five wide. So I can understand from a schematic standpoint how exciting this is for Kyle Shanahan. My concern is, and this is my biggest concern probably for the 49ers as a whole, are we going to allow this guy to play the position that he's succeeded at? And that is wide receiver. I really don't want to take another to- a third round pick or you know any pick for that matter and move them away from where they have shown success as a quote unquote project because he's so versatile. Every time they say versatile now, I get pissed off because they keep taking these players that are very successful and putting them in places they're not successful. So yeah, I know I'm being a little critical here, but I love this pick. I I got a lot of slack for it. I had Jalen Hurd rated ahead of Debo Debo Samuel in my wide receiver rankings. I had him back-to-back, but I love Jalen Hurd. I I really do. This is my favorite pick of this entire draft class. Probably Nick Bosa, but that that was a slam dunk. Everybody knew that was happening. This This is perfect. And so if we allow him to play that big slot, I want him to be starting big slot day one, the very first play of the game. I want him as my slot receiver. I love Trent Taylor. I love Richie James Jr. I think that they have value, and I think that we can use them. Uh, You know, you want to put them out there at slot on third and short and then move Jalen Hurd to the running back or something like that. I'm fine with that. But I want this guy starting at slot receiver, and I want him staying there. You want to add more weight, that's fine. He's got the speed. He's got the movement to stay there. But I want this guy there. Now, is he a polished route runner yet? No, he's not. He's been playing the position for a year. But his movements and his everything that he does, his measurables, his workout, they say that it can happen. And so I I love this pick. I'm really, really excited to see what happens. I'm just really, really scared that we're going to get a little too, hey, we're smarter than everybody else, and we're going to take away what he does best. And I don't want to do that. I really, really don't. So there are some issues with him getting off the line of scrimmage, but he's so damn strong and big, it's going to be rough to stop him. And again, I don't think you want to start this guy out wide. I think your outside wide receivers are Debo Samuel and Dante Pettis, and you can mix in Marquise Goodwin and maybe Bourne if he sticks around, even Jordan Matthews. I think your inside guys are Trent Taylor, Richie James, and I would put 
Jalen Hurd at the top of that list. I want that big slot and just do some weird things. Very similar to what Pittsburgh has done with Juju Smith-Schuster. I think that would be another one that would be really, really good. So hopefully you enjoyed this. I'm so excited to see what this guy can do and lots more fun stuff. We're going to have more. I'm going to keep breaking down the draft, but uh, I'm not going to be spending an entire podcast on a punter. I can guarantee you that. So stay strong, faithful. I'll be talking with you soon.